habit of doing that. <laughs> Good morning, church. Ephesians 2, the passage Mike just read. It's interesting because it starts off with these um, characterizations of us as humanity that we would perhaps gloss over or, or dismiss. You know, th- the things that, you know, we're dead in our trespasses and sins and things that don't really build up our self-esteem. And then there's the big but right there in verse 5, right? Whenever there is a but inserted in Scripture, it is important to understand, but God makes us alive in Christ. Yeah, good news, right? See, Paul is following an important recipe for us to really understand the beauty of God's love shown to us in Jesus Christ, and that is this. You've got to understand the predicament we're in as humanity before we ever understand the glorious beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's just the way it is. You know, I remember watching my, one of my favorite movies, and I'm sure you guys are going you're gonna to have solidarity with me in this, Shawshank Redemption, one of the best movies ever made. Anyone there with me on that one? No matter what channel it's on, no matter what time of day or night, you turn it on, and you're like, oh, Shawshank, we're just going to stop and watch it, right? Uh, it takes you to the plums of, of the depths and darkness of, of human depravity and sinfulness, but I tell you, the exhilaration of joy at the end when Andy Dufresne finds freedom, right? swimming through the sewer, right? We all celebrate at that moment, right? You have to plumb the depths of darkness before we understand the exaltation of being set free and finding liberty. Amen? So that's why we're here this morning. So thank you, Mike, for Ephesians 2. Hold your finger there because we're going to turn back to it. But go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 3 is where we're currently spending our time in the study of origins And um, if if you've been with us for any amount of time, we're going through Genesis verse by verse. Because if we understand the first 11 chapters of Genesis, we're going to make sense of God. We're going to make sense of our world. We're going to make sense of our lives, our own hearts, the things we like to do, the things we don't like to do. Um, And so the the question of origins and and the questions that Genesis answers is important for us once again, because we live in a world that has changed in the past 24 hours. Last time we met for worship last week, the world has changed once again dramatically. I mean, whether we're talking about Korea and, and peace uh, talks, whether we're talking about another school shooting in Houston, uh, the world is continually changing, and in, in a lot of our understandings, it's not changing for the better. And we once again come together in this assembly we call the church, and go, how do we make sense of this? You know, how do we even wrap our minds around this continuation of what we perceive as evil seems to be more rampant than ever? And yet we realize that it's not going to be legislation, and it's not going to be passing laws, and those things may help, but there's a deeper, deeper issue. And can I just tell you what it is? It's our own hearts. Can you write that down? Can I get someone to say, preach it, brother? Something happened right now. Because we have a woman, man, I don't know what you want to call him or her, but in Ontario, Canada, just a couple days ago, the first birth certificate was issued with someone claiming to be non-binary, meaning... There's neither an M for male nor an F for female, but there's an X because they don't want to have you call him, her, him, her, she, he. It will be a generic they, them with an X on their birth certificate. And we, 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 and I don't know this person. And I would love to sit down with this person. And I don't know if daddy didn't love him or her enough. I don't know if mommy loved him or her enough. I don't know if they were disciplined or not disciplined. I'm probably thinking not disciplined. Usually people that want the world to cater to them are the ones that have never had no said to them. That's a whole different sermon for a whole different time. But we live in a world where there's confusion, right? You want to know how someone's male or female? Well, it happens the day you're born, the doctor spreads your legs and goes, is there external plumbing or internal plumbing? You're male if you're born with male organs, and you're female if you're born with female organs, and that's all i got to say to it. The problem is when we allow our feelings and our emotions to begin to dictate our lives. And you cannot live in a society 
where your feelings and emotions are leading the way. Last week we saw with Adam and Eve, man, woman, garden, Genesis 3, what happens when you allow your emotions to dictate your life. There's nothing but complication and problems. And the more we allow people to, you know, basically change laws and and change rules and You know, even Cosmo Kramer from Seinfeld said, Jerry, if there's no rules, there's chaos. So here's to the theology of Cosmo Kramer, amen? The reality of it is there are rules. There is order. There is truth. And truth is not whatever your whim or will wants it to be. The truth is the one from the one who's created us, who's designed it all, So it would behoove us to make sense of things from his perspective. And yet psychologists and therapists continue to scratch their heads, right? And go, why are we becoming more barbaric? And why are we becoming more dehumanized? Is because we are catering to everyone's tribe. And the tribalism among us as humanity continues to be more and more segregated. And God says... You're of one tribe, and that tribe's called humanity. And all people are born with dignity and respect simply because they're created in the image of God. But now we want to cater to everyone's wishes and whims, and before you know it, we're just going to go crazy. And I want to prevent that from happening, amen? So today we get to talk about original sin. I know it's what everyone wanted to talk about today. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to raise the bar on all of you. And I'm going to challenge your emotions and your feelings because this is no place right now for emotions and feelings. I'm going to say things that will offend you. I will say things that are going to challenge your beliefs. I'm going to challenge things that are going to question your theology. But I'm going to do it not because these are things that I want to espouse or I want you to believe because Pastor Scott believes them. I'm going to share these things with you because they come to us in black and white through God's revealed word, i.e. the Bible. And I want to do it because until you understand the things we're talking about this morning, you will never understand the great grace and glorious love of Jesus Christ. That is tantamount. Okay, that is what is supremely important. In a sense, we're not here to make friends. We're here to be redeemed by one who can only redeem us because we can't redeem ourselves. What a friend we have in Jesus, yes. But before you become a friend in Jesus, the Bible says you're a slave of sin. And you're an enemy of God. And I want that relationship to change, and only by his grace is that able to happen. G.K. Chesterton, if you're not familiar with Chesterton, amazing thinker, contemporary of C.S. Lewis, he said this about original sin. He said, you know what? If, if you want to question original sin, well, I'm going to tell you right now that original sin is the one Christian truth that can be verified by observation anywhere in the world any day of the week. You question original sin, just read the newspaper right now, right today. Pick up your news feed. Wherever you get your news from, you will see the marks of original sin all over. So, so we are here to talk about bad news. But unless we understand how bad the news really is, we'll never understand how great and good the good news really is. All right? We are here to to talk about sinfulness. And it must be highlighted if, if the grace of Jesus Christ is to be appreciated. Man has been corrupted and ruined. Men and women have have had the image of God marred in their lives. And Jesus came to restore that marred image. And so four things we need to understand this morning And I'm going to really take you on a trajectory from from the past, the garden, man, woman, up through Jesus to our current day and then ultimately to the future. We're going to go on 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 a journey together where we need to understand there's four steps when it comes to our lives that we need to understand. And some of us may be caught between step one, step two. Some of us may be between step two and step three. Some of us may be between step three and step four. But I want us to understand there's a trajectory that the Bible gives us. And there's four things. The first is this. There's the state of innocence. See, this is where humanity started. God put man, created woman out of man, placed them in a garden. 
idyllic situation, perfect situation, had freedom to do whatever they wanted to do. And so in the state of innocence, you need to understand two truths that are reality. One is man and woman were able to do good, and they were also able to sin. Let's have a discussion of the topic of free will. Free will means my will has the capacity to do whatever it wants. Whatever is placed in front of me, I have the choice. I am going to be self-determined in making whatever choice according to my desires, according to my inclination. Man, woman, in the garden, Genesis 3, were created with free will. They had the ability to do good and the ability to sin. That is truly a free will. Genesis chapter 3. Turn in your Bibles, if you would. Verses 6 and 7. And again, we cannot understand anything else in the scriptures about Jesus, about God, about the gospel, about the cross, about Christmas, about Easter, whatever, until you understand this. This is critically important. Chapter 3, Genesis, it says this, that the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and you know what the tree was? It was the one tree that God said was off limits. And I want you to know something, that this really has nothing to do with the tree. This has everything to do with the choice that's being made. God could have said, don't cross that river. God could have said, don't climb that mountain. God could have said, don't ride that zebra. See, the, the object is not important. The heart, the choice is what's critical. So the woman sees that the tree is good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. Now notice, every qualification that's mentioned there has to do with what she wants. What is going on in her heart? Well, this is all about self-deification. This is about self-glorification. This is about soul self-satisfaction. It's all about me, right? Even though God had said that is off-limits. She finds it desirable. She wants it. This, this is the, the, the horror of temptation. We talked about this last week, Genesis, uh, James chapter 1, right? Love, lust gives birth to sin. Sin gives birth to death. And she sees it. She takes from it fruit and eats, and she also gives to her husband, who is there the whole time, yet totally silent. He is more guilty than she is because her sin is unbelief. His sin is blatant rebellion. He's the one that was instructed by God, you stay away from that. And obviously he didn't see it as an important enough command to step in and stop the conversation between the serpent and Eve from ever taking place. This is why the Bible holds Adam guilty. Because his is outright rebellion. So she eats, she gives to him, he eats, and then notice verse 7. Here it is. This explains it all. The eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. So here's the issue. They've been naked before, but in, in their nakedness previously, they were, they were not ashamed. There was, a, there was, a, there was a, a pure intimacy. There was a transparent vulnerability that did not involve judgment or condemnation. But now something's different. They're naked as a result of their disobedience and their rebellion. And now they know only, write these two words down if you would, guilt and estrangement. Because what we're going to pick up on next week is what do they do now that they realize, oh crap, we've done what God has commanded us not to do. Have you ever been in that oh crap moment? Yeah, we've all been there before. And we're going to talk next week about what happens when you're exposed and God sees you for who you truly are and you're not ready for him to see you in your, your nakedness. We're going to talk next week about guilt, shame, fear. But before we get there, we have to deal with what is happening right here in these two verses. Man has exercised 
free will. Now the question comes up, could God have created man, woman, so that they didn't fall morally, that they didn't fall spiritually? Could, man, could God have created man and woman that they couldn't have chosen to disobey? Yeah, he could have, but that would not be a truly free moral agent. Hence, there would be no vibrant relationship because if you create an object with the only the ability to love and you don't create an object with the equal ability to not love, you don't have a truly relational free will relationship. Right? So to the extent that this, these two people had the capacity to love God, he also created them with the capacity to hate him. That is truly free will. And yet what happens is man acts upon that free will and brings corruption now, not just to him and his wife, but now the entire human race. But don't hear this. God is not the author of sin. God is not the one who has, who has created this evil. See, God created the potential for evil, but it is man who has actualized that potentiality. And what we have now is, watch this, an ontological parasite. There should be something there that isn't. And that's what evil is. It is the absence of good. It is the absence of morality. It is the absence of ethics. It is the absence of God who is the author of these things that are good. And now the parasitic nature of sin, it eats away of what we know ought to be there but isn't. You still with me? Coffee bar's closed. You need to, you need to pay attention. There's no more caffeine for you. So, it is man that has actualized the potentiality. And so what we need to understand is when we look at our world and we're scratching our heads and go, why is there another school shooting? Why are there corrupt dictators? Why are there people who are questioning their own identity, their sexual orientation? What we need to realize is that the source of evil is not God's power. It's mankind's freedom. Man and woman exercise now their will and their choice even though those things are corrupted and so when it comes to school shootings and when it comes to evil dictators it's not that god is forcing the hand he's not this deterministic god who plays everyone like puppets we are self-determining creatures who have now uh, realized the effects of the corruption of the original sin issues. The original sin doesn't just have to do with Genesis 3 and stick there. It has to do with the result of what has happened even to our day today. So the issue of original sin. The result of the rebellion in Genesis 3. The corruption that has now been sent headlong into the future of humanity and will continue to be with us until Jesus recreates all things anew. See, what we have to understand is that man could have been created with the capacity to choose only what was right, but God did not want a relationship with, his, with, with mankind like that. And so he chose to uh, disobey God, and now we've been plunged into this predicament, and I will say it is a predicament, where now no part of who we are is untouched by sin. What you need to hear, and you need to hear clearly, is that we are not all as evil as we could all possibly be. Amen? There is continual room for deprovement in our evil sinfulness. But what we do need to hear is that every faculty of who we are as humans is touched and tainted by sin. My emotions, my feelings, my rationality, my relationality, every part of who I am as a person created in the image of God is touched and tainted by sin. That's the result. And there's nothing now that we could ever do in God's eyes to earn his favor because we are now, by nature, sinners. Ephesians chapter 2, Mike read it. We are, by nature, children of wrath. Try putting that on a business card and, and drum up some customers. 
right? Hi, I'm, I'm a child of wrath. <laughs> you are dead in your trespasses and sins, and you are by nature children of wrath. That doesn't sit well with us, does it? That doesn't speak to my self-esteem. You're just saying negative, critical things. You want to boost me? I cannot boost you up until I take you down. This is not about self-esteem. This is about an honest diagnosis of where we are all at because the fact is this, we're all born sinners. Even those cute little babies you hold in your arm, you're like, oh, they're so adorable. They're still a little monster, little sinner. Now, you don't want to necessarily say that, especially to a new parent, right? Because they're so, but the third child, they go, yeah, we know. We know. We've got other ones roaming around the house. I got this little demon right here, right in my arms, right? We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. That is important to understand. By nature, you are a sinner. And I know this doesn't sell books. And I know Oprah won't invite me to be on her television program. And I know I won't speak at the next royal wedding. I know these things are true because we don't want to hear this. And yet, we need to hear this. You despise the doctor who tells you that you don't have cancer when every bit of evidence says you do. Because he or she doesn't want to offend you or make you upset. You want a doctor who's going to give you an honest, accurate diagnosis. Because the reality of it is this, Romans chapter 1. Don't turn your Bible there, but write it down, look at it later. We'd rather worship the creation than the creator. The Bible says that we suppress the truth in unrighteousness, even though the evidence is all around us. Creation testifies to the greatness and ma majesty of God, and yet we suppress it in unrighteousness. We explain the sunsets because of evolution. We explain the, the Grand Canyon by evolution. We explain all these processes of how we arrive where we're at by mere, you know, random bits of evolution. That you descended from primordial ooze. That you were once an amoeba, you know, with some sort of purpose. Which, you know, try to define that, right? And we try to explain God away from it all. And yet you try to explain God away from creation. You still have your conscience to deal with. And your conscience bears witness against you because you suppress the truth. And you know not, not what to do with your guilt and your shame. We run and we hide and we're fearful. Why? Because we don't understand what it's like to come into the, the, the x-ray light of God's beauty and grace. Even Jesus said this in John chapter 3. He says, men and women will not come into the light lest their deeds be exposed. So they'd rather live in the darkness than be exposed and be loved. So Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says, here's the situation. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, who's that one man? Adam. And death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. You don't sit there and go, I read my name, not in that list right there. Scott's immune. Nope, I'm, I've, got, I've got an exemption. I've got a hall pass. All means all, and that's all all means. Death and sin has now spread to everybody. So Adam was our representative head of humanity. Just like being a part of a nation whose president may declare war and now he commits the entire nation to combat for why. He is our representative. And the people will say, we declared war because they accept that the president acted on their behalf and they are involved with him in the consequences of that declaration. And should the war be lost, it is we who have lost it. And so similarly, because Adam was our God-appointed representative, we are all in solidarity with him, and we all share in the judicial consequences of his transgression. And this is what we call now penal involvement. Legally, we are bound to Adam as our federal head of the human race, and now we are cursed because of it. But the glorious news in Romans 5 is that Jesus came as the second Adam and now is a representative head of all who would believe in him to now be freed from the consequences of sin and find liberty and light and love through what Jesus Christ has done. And there's no saying, I don't want Adam as my representative head. God, in his sovereign wisdom, placed Adam and Eve 
knowing full well what would happen as the ones that would represent the human race. And now we have one who stand in, stood in the place that we, we need desperately, who would accomplish the law, who would live perfectly, and that is Jesus. And I thank God that we are now able to know the second head, the representative of our salvation, Jesus Christ. So, the state of innocence. Adam and Eve, the ability to do good, but the ability to sin. Now, the second point is this, and we've been talking about this. Let me expose it a little bit more. I know you don't want to go deeper, but we're going deeper. There's a state of sin now. We're now gone from the state of innocence into the state of sin, where the human condition is this. We are able only to sin. Okay? Now, I want to explain this because there's a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to this point. Because what has happened now is that God said, if you eat from the tree that I've, I've commanded you not to eat from, there's a consequence, and it says this, you shall surely die. Two forms of death in the Bible. There's physical death and there's spiritual death. Actually, you can add a third death. There's eternal death, but we're not going to talk about that this morning. Physical death, spiritual death. So they, they're going to die, but obviously they ate of the fruit, but they didn't die right away. Isn't that interesting? It's like, well, they didn't die, and they probably thought they were doing okay. Like, oh, we're not dead, but what died was not their physical, biological bodies, but what died was their spiritual nature. This is why they realized their nakedness, now not in a positive light, but a negative light, and they tried to cover themselves. And this is what we try to do when the guilt and the shame and the fear comes up. We try to cover our nakedness, and even fig leaves aren't going to do it. And we're going to talk about that more next week. This will be fun. So there's a state of sin. And spiritual death is brought about. When Adam sinned, he and the woman died spiritually. And now they are alive in the flesh, but they are dead in the spirit. Can I tell you how many times this theme runs throughout Scripture? Honest, healthy assessment, but not something we like to embrace. Think of the Ezekiel vision of the Valley of Dry Bones, right? These are dead bones that the spirit that came in from God breathed life into these, these bones and raised them up. Even Jesus talked about the importance of being born again because we are born dead in our trespasses and sin. As a matter of fact, you're going to want to write down a few verses this morning. So I want you to get ready for these. But we need to talk about two things regarding spiritual death. We have natural ability. And I want to explain that. But we lack moral ability. And that we need to differentiate between what's natural ability. The fact is people can do good things. We're not saying people do, do bad things. I mean, we see people do good things. I mean, probably some of us were the recipients of someone's charitable act this week. Someone's kind deed done to us. Perhaps we were the ones who, who did that for somebody else. But I want you to know the problem here is, though, we have natural ability. This is called God's common grace. That people do good things. But even Thomas Aquinas said, and he's one of the great church thinkers, and if you ever want to read Aquinas, I would commend him to you. Aquinas observed that people are seeking happiness, and people are seeking peace, and they're seeking relief, seeking relief from their guilt and personal fulfillment, and other such benefits, and we understand that these benefits can be found ultimately in God alone, and what we tend to do is we mistake their seeking these things versus seeking God himself. See, it's one thing to want the gifts, but it's another thing to want the giver. It's one thing to want the benefits. It's another thing to want the benefactor. And what we understand is while we do not dismiss the natural ability of human beings, we need to understand that why people do what they do is never motivated from a heart that wants to glorify God. Hence, the George Clooney. I mean, does he not end up at every wedding? He was at the royal wedding this weekend. You know, we, we can look at things that George Clooney does and go, boy, he's such a humanitarian and, and his wife and they do such good things. But here's the biggest question. Why do you do what you do, George? Because if it's not 
for the glory of God. If it is not motivated from a place that says, I want to praise God, then that natural ability, which we call good in God's eyes, is bad. Because here's what the Bible says, Romans chapter 14, verse 23. Write it down. I don't know if we have it on the screen, but it says this. Whatever is not of faith is sin. Can can I just say it one more time? Whatever is not prompted, whatever is not motivated, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So while we see the good things that the world does, and we're going to call them civil acts of virtue. Jonathan Edwards deemed those civil acts of virtue basically enlightened acts of self-interest. Blaise Pascal, French scientist who knew Christ, popularized the quote, there's a God-shaped void inside every human life, said these words, the heart has its reasons while the reason knows nothing about. We do things, but we don't know what's prompting us to do it. Or henceforth, humanity does good things and doesn't know why it's motivated. Perhaps it's like what Edward said, just enlightened self-enlightenment, self-interest. Woody Allen popularized it when he was in court because he was dating his stepdaughter, sick. 1993, he said this, the heart wants what it wants. And yet, while you're so quick to judge Woody Allen just at this moment, look at your own heart because you also have the same disease within you. Your heart wants what it wants. And even though you're sitting there going, but I'm a good person, Your heart wants those things that are contrary to the glory of God. You're seeking the gifts, but you don't want the giver. You want the benefits, but you don't want the benefactor. And this is the issue and the diagnosis of every human heart is this. While we have natural ability and we can do good things, we're not doing them for the right reasons. So while we do civil acts of virtue, what we are missing out on are the things done of salvific value. Things pertaining to salvation with a motivation, a heart that says, I want to glorify God. I want to praise God. See, Jesus was in a time where he was talking to religious leaders. I mean, these are the guys that should have known it and they didn't. He nailed them and said, I know your hearts and your motivation is not to please God. It is to please yourself. And and unfortunately, we live in a culture where evangelicalism is preaching a gospel of self-appeasement, self-interest, self-aggrandizement. And it is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't grow churches. I'm sorry. It doesn't sell books. I'm sorry. It doesn't get the pastor to speak at the conference where there's 10,000 people saying, how do you grow churches? Well, it's not preaching messages like this. But we're not in the business of growing churches. We're in the business of introducing people to a Lord and a Savior who knows you in all your wretchedness and loves you just the same. You've never been called a wretch, have you? Paul calls himself the chief of sinners. Are you willing to put yourself below that? I mean, let's take an honest assessment of ourselves. Consider some passages this morning. Write these down. Don't want you to miss this. We lack the moral ability. We lack the moral ability. Pastor at the royal wedding, Michael Curry. Who watched the royal wedding? Just raise your hand. No judgment. No judgment. Who watched the royal wedding? Okay. You guys are like, you're hardcore, right? 2 a.m., 3 a.m., whatever time it was. What I appreciate, Michael Curry. So most reverend, Michael Curry. Like, how do you get that title? Most reverend. Like, I almost made it, but I'm not at that level yet, right? So most reverend, Michael Curry. Powerful, emotional message on love unlike anything that had ever been spoken and preached at a royal wedding and you know what michael curry said fantastic things he quoted martin luther king jr and he he quoted song of solomon and even on the way in this morning i'm listening to him interviewed on npr and i'm like i like this guy and he's talking about love And then we can do better. 
and he saw love in Prince Harry and Meghan in their eyes, and, you know, he's just positive and optimistic, and, and there's one thing I did not hear in his 45-minute message at the wedding, and there's one thing I did not hear in his NPR interview, the centrality of Christ to be the people we are designed to be. Where is the message of sinfulness? And where is the message now on top of sinfulness of grace? Because honestly, Prince Harry doesn't love his wife the way Christ loves the church. And, and Princess Megan is not going to love her husband the way Christ responds, you know, the church responds to the love of Christ. I don't care how happy they look. It is not a message of love that is going to save the world. It is a message that we are sinners and we fall short of the glory of God and only the grace of Christ is able to lift us from this miry pit. Right? I'm not going to puff you up with Oprah Winfrey theology and say, just go out and be good people. No, that will continue to condemn your soul to hell. You stop and understand the wickedness and the sin and the darkness that dwells within. And you bow to the only Savior that's able to redeem your wretched soul from hell because he is good. Not you. I understand continually the glorious grace of Christ. And you know how I understand it? Because it humbles me. God's grace in Christ doesn't exalt you necessarily, it humbles you. And when you are humbled, according to Ephesians, uh, Philippians chapter 2, you will one day be exalted. But the whole time you're humbled or exalted, you'll never take credit for that yourself. You are leaning entirely on the grace of Christ. I'm all for love. But love that is not motivated for the glory of God through the power of Jesus Christ is not love. It is hate. Whatever is not of faith is sin. Is God opposed to sin? Yes. Because you, do, you cannot grip this stuff and understand this stuff and look at the cross of Christ in the same way again. Jesus did not die for nice people. Jesus did not die for good people. Jesus died for people who hate him, who despise him, who spit at him, who curse at him, and don't want anything to do with his kingdom because we're too busy building our own kingdom. And any other message is a cardinal tenet of humanistic philosophy. We are dead. In our trespasses and sins. Any other message is humanist, humanistic philosophy. Good luck with that. Joel Osteen preaches a, a message of, of good. Oh man, every time I watch Joel, he, the problem is he, he gets half of it right. He's not talking this way. Because you'll move from the home of the Houston Rockets to the local coffee house. That's what you'll do. Ephesians chapter 2, look at these verses. In case you haven't been slapped enough, here we go. Let's get some more, all right? There's no other message I'd rather preach than this. You, you need to know this. Because I, it's not, once again, to make you feel awful. It is to once again showcase the majestic beauty of Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, write these verses down. Verses 1 and 5. Do we have these on the screen? Did I give them to you? Our tech guys do an awesome job. We're getting it. We don't have it. Okay, let me read it for you. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Even when we were dead in our trespasses and transgressions, God made us alive together in Christ. Who acted on our behalf? God did. Romans chapter 8. Do we have this one? Because you guys need to see this one. Romans 8, verses 7 and 8. Do we have that verse? Yeah, we're getting there. Must be Apple products. Okay. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile. Do you know how, I mean, when was the last time you used the word hostile in your relationship dialogue? For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot 
Don't you love Paul? Like, he's writing, he's going, okay, I know there's going to be people that are going to try to wiggle out of this. Cannot implies ability. This is a universal diagnosis. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You want more? Thanks for asking. John 6. Jesus said this in verses 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. No one has the ability to come to Christ. Why? Because we don't want Jesus. We want our sin, we want our flesh, we want our pleasures, we want anything but Jesus. Because that's the, the, the object of affection of our hearts, ourselves. And then he says it again in, in, in verse 65, I believe it is. He said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father is, it grants it to him. And here's what happens in John 6. People go, Jesus, what you're saying is really hard. And people left him. Because they'd rather have humanistic philosophy than the actual true theology. And then he repeats it. Hey, now that I cleared the room, let me clear it out some more. You do not have the ability to love God. No one has the ability to love God. Unless, oh, unless God acts upon that heart. And does a work of grace. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. But God makes us alive. Now do you understand the supreme grace. And supreme sovereignty. And supreme in, in majesty of God. Doing what he didn't have to do. But he does it. Because we lack the moral ability. To do these things. Jesus calls us morally impotent. He's stating an universal inability. Paul reaffirms it. Second, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Here's what it says. It says, the natural person, the one who does not know Christ, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he is not able to understand them. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Romans 8, verses 7 and 8. The mind of the flesh is set on the things of the flesh, but the mind of the spirit, the one that has been renewed, redeemed, reclaimed by Christ, is able now to discern spiritual things. All glory be to God. Amen? We understand this because the rest of Genesis is not going to make an inch of, of sense to you. That what God does for Adam and Eve and for the rest of humanity is not going to make sense to you unless this is a solid foundation in your understanding. Romans chapter 3, bonus verse. Write this down. I'm not charging you for this. There is none who seeks after God, no, not one. None that wants God, neither Jew nor Greek. This is a universal situation. Why? Because there's a controlling force in our lives called sin, and that controlling force says your nature will be dictated by this, and it will know nothing else until it is acted upon by an outside agent. Because it is God who makes us alive in Christ. Amen? Ephesians chapter 2. Martin Luther called this the bondage of the will. He was countering another book written by a guy called The Freedom of the Will. Let's see, put them up at, at Barnes & Noble. Which one's going to sell? You've got Freedom of the Will. Yeah, we like that because we're free. No, you're not. Bondage of the Will. Because everything in us as human beings is set against God. We don't want him. There's none who seeks after God. All right. Enough beating and bruising, you guys. Number three, a state of grace. Grace is what is given to us in and through Jesus Christ. There's no grace apart from Jesus. And now, in relationship with Christ, you are restored to now the ability to do good and the ability to sin. We're right back where we started from. 
yeah, a few little bumps along the way, wouldn't you agree? A few little obstacles to get through, right? Praise God for his, his relentless mercy. Who now says, I'm going to not only redeem you, I'm going to recreate you. And this is exactly what Jesus does. He not only saves us, but he is going to restore the image of God, which sin has marred in every one of our lives. God is in the business of doing spiritual makeovers. Woo! And so now as a believer in Christ, and what I mean believer in Christ is I have come to him and I've acknowledged my sin. I've come to him and I've acknowledged my, my heart of darkness and my heart of stone. And I've acknowledged the fact that there's nothing that good that dwells in me. And I can do nothing apart from his saving grace. And I bow to him as Lord and Savior. And I accept the free gift of eternal life, which is Ephesians chapter 2, right? For by grace you're saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is entirely a work of God so that you couldn't boast about it. But you can point to God and give him the glory. For we are his workmanship now created in Christ Jesus for good works. So now I am set free. I have no longer a heart of stone. I have a heart of flesh made alive in Christ. And now I have a life where I'm able to do not only good, but I'm also able to sin. Don't buy into the lie of some Christians where they say you'll never sin again. That's baloney. Just hang out with me any afternoon, okay? You'll, you'll see it firsthand. Especially when the Cowboys lose. And thank God, NFL season. I have less sinning right now than I do during the NFL season. But here's the reality of it is, Jesus now has us in a state of grace. We're given that which we don't deserve, so now I have the power to do good. He gives me the power to live the life that I uh, not, not necessarily want to live, but that God wants me to live. And I do it by his power. I can never do it on my own steam. But you have to understand, though, too, that I'm still working out the old nature of sin that used to dwell in me. And I still sometimes act like an idiot and sometimes I still drive like a jerk and I'm sorry if I cut you off on the freeway but I want you to know that even though my momentary issues of sin in my life are covered by the grace of God and there's no sin that could ever send me out of God's grace I'm forever in his God's, gra uh, God's grace because of Jesus's constant love and now you need to understand this it's not the fact that I will ever lose my position your position in Christ is permanent but my practice may look a little sketchy at times. But he's forever my Abba Daddy. And he's forever my Lord and Savior. And now I live longing to do good works, even though sometimes I don't long for those good works. And I do it not to earn his approval. He's already given it to me, but I do it because I'm already approved in Christ. And that's the difference. I don't walk around like my love for God's like a daisy where he loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves you not. Always kind of sensitive like, uh, is he the divine judge or policeman today going to condemn me? No, he's my Abba Daddy. He loves me. But sometimes my performance is not up to par. And he says, get up, let's do it again. He's a God of mulligans, and I love mulligans. If you've ever seen me on the golf course, you know how much I appreciate mulligans. You get do-overs because he is perfecting you. Not that you'll ever be perfect, but he's making you more into the image of Christ. And it's not going to come without obstacles. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8. Verse 1, there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. He's conforming you into the image of Jesus. And that conforming work takes time. But yet, the state of grace, knowing that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor heaven nor hell will ever separate me from the love of Jesus Christ, is the assurance that God is not done with me yet. That I'm loved greater than I could ever imagine. And I'm accepted great, greater than I could ever imagine. And there's nothing now that I could ever do to make God love me anymore, make me love me any less. He loves me perfectly in Christ. I was thinking about the, the royal wedding. I'm sorry, it's a hot topic, right? And I think the buzz is over the woman that Prince Harry chose to now bring into the royal family. 
I mean, who would have ever guessed? Right? This, this actress, this, this woman from America, this mixed race parents. I mean, it's all so cool to look at and consider. And yet she would not be a part of the royal family now if it wasn't for the invitation of someone that's part of that royal family. And I go, the spiritual reality is, is this. Being part of God's royal kingdom could never happen to anyone unless you're invited by the prince of peace named Jesus. Who says, you, come here. Love me. Adore me. Worship me. When you come in and you appreciate me for who I am, then you can have all this. Guys, I'm a beggar. I was a slave to sin. But somehow the prince found me and said, come be a part of royalty. And he's put on a robe of righteousness around me. And he's accepted me. Who am I? I I'm nobody. But yet he thought I was somebody. He says, now you're a part of this royal kingdom. And so the royalty that has been diminished by sin has been restored because of the grace of Jesus Christ. Who's grateful for that? Man. Glory, hallelujah. There's one who loves us more than we could ever understand. Even in our wretchedness. Because God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. To make us who were once paupers now princes in his kingdom. That is a royal wedding. Whose consummation is yet to come. Last point. A state of glory. We're not there yet. This this is the foretaste of what's to come. Right? The grace of Christ now promising you a seat at the marriage table because of his grace. He's saying, taste my goodness now. The psalmist declared, taste and see that the Lord is good. We taste because he has given us the appetite to taste. We taste because he's given us this insatiable desire to hunger for something more than this world offers. We taste because of his grace. And yet it's a foretaste of glory when he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come sit at the table. Come enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we will not be able to avert our eyes from Him who is glorious, worthy of praise, the Lamb in the center of it all, deserving of all attention, and we will be there in glory with only now the ability to do good. Sin will be done with. Sin will be eradicated. There will be no more death, no more sin, no more disease. There will be only glory and goodness where our king, king and kingdom abide because He is good and gracious. Taste the glory now, but anticipate it greatly because it's yet to come. Amen? We're passing through, you guys. This is not our home. You are made for so much more than this. But the journey is not significant without Christ. And I hope I've made that clear today. Has has that been, been obvious? Can I lean on my wife real quick? How are we doing over there? You're doing awesome? Oh, well, good. Praise God. (laughs) Love you guys. I literally, before the message, about five minutes before the message, I went to the bathroom, and there was something in my spirit. I think it was just the enemy saying, don't go do that. Don't go preach that message. But I'm not here to be a people pleaser. I'm here to be a God pleaser. And if God is glorified and Christ is exalted, I've done my job. Amen? I love you guys. Love Jesus and serve him forever. Let's stand, let's pray. Lord, honestly, you have diagnosed our souls and our spirits and our lives in a way that is uncomfortable. We don't like it. It hurts. 
And yet, you have taken the divine scalpel of your word, and you've gone to those places that are really, really sensitive. But Lord, your objective is to remove the disease that is preventing us from seeing Christ. Removing that disease that's preventing us from loving Jesus. Lord, you don't want us to love our sin, and you don't want us to love the gift, and you don't want us to love the benefits. You want us to love your son. This is why you were pleased in the bruising of your son so that Christ could be exalted and and people would respond to him. And if we have Jesus, we have everything. There is nothing more glorious than him, our Lord and our Savior, our King and our Prince forever. Incline our hearts to desire him. Remove the blinders that the enemy has put up, preventing us from believing. And help us not live in unbelief, but help us to believe in him and have that spirit of belief rampant in our lives. And let our hearts continuously desire Christ. Thank you for the obstacles, Lord, you have overcome. Thank you for the hardness that you have broken through. Thank you for the darkness that you battled. So that we who were part of that lost sheep that wandered, we have once now been found. We were once blind, but now we see and we say glory, hallelujah. What a savior. What a friend. So thank you for the adoption we have into your family. Thank you for the work you are doing. Thank you for being God. And may you get the glory forever and ever. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great day, you guys. Love you. See you soon, all right? Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out the churchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon. Thank you.